I want to speak on the subject of the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord. And I believe there is a lot of confusion today on exactly what the presence of the Lord is. And if there is a definition uh, that I think needs to be sort of cleared up, and a concept that needs to be cleared up, it is that of the presence of the Lord. I think of many words that we use all the time that um, are misused, and they're not really used in a biblical way. And whenever the Lord gives me an opportunity, I like to share uh, along these types of lines to try to help us think as biblically as we can think about these topics. John 14, verse 15, a very familiar uh, chapter of the Bible. So when you have that, just signify by saying amen to that. Amen. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. You see that. So the first thing we see here is that it is the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, that represents the presence of God in the earth. So the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and will be in you. Now, I just want to say real quickly that these are two prepositions. Prepositions denote location. So when we say something is in something, if I say in the house, that's a prepositional phrase that denotes location. So if the Holy Spirit is with the disciples, there will come a point when he will be in the disciples. How many of you know that's a change of location? With becomes in. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. And at that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world. And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Father, we're just grateful to gather together tonight to turn our hearts and thoughts to you, Lord. We just pray that you would superintend our minds. Give us the exact words to speak in this message tonight. Help us to have clarity. Help us to have an understanding of what it is to know the very presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, and everyone said amen. It is very clear from these passages, though often overlooked, that the key to the presence of the Lord, the key to the coming and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, 
is our own obedience to God's Word. It is our obedience to the teachings of Jesus, which he said he had received from his Father. If you look at verse 21 again, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So you see this is all uh, brought together and tethered by this one great truth. If we want to have the Lord reveal himself to us, then we have to have an attitude of obedience to God's word. Now, when we talk about obedience, obedience begins, first of all, with knowing the Word of God, but also at the same time, agreeing with what God has said. How many of you know people hear what God says, but they don't agree? You tell them something about God's Word, say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. And then they have a different idea. But, it, the, but the first thing is to agree with what the Lord said. As a matter of fact, the first step to being forgiven of our sins is that we must agree with the Lord. 1 John 1 and 9, what does the scripture say? If we acknowledge our sin, that word is homologia, means to say the same thing as, if we acknowledge our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we have to agree with the Lord. The book of Amos has a saying, and it is a very powerful truth as well. Can any two walk together unless they be agreed? You have to be in agreement. So when we're talking about the kingdom of God, when we're talking about the presence of the Lord, we're talking about an environment, we're talking about a place where the people that are together are in agreement concerning what is right and what is wrong. And that is so vitally important. Again, what is Jesus saying here? Judas said to him, not Iscariot, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? But Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him or her and make our home with them. You see that? We will make our home with people who obey the word of God and, of course, keep his word, and that signifies that we truly love the Lord. That's what it is. All of these things are in agreement, going all the way back into the Old Testament. This is a tremendous truth. So obedience is the key to the presence of God. Now, there is a viewpoint that the way in which we get the presence of God to come, if you will, and the way in which that we get God to manifest himself is by singing, is by worshiping, and is by doing things like this. And this has given rise to the whole idea that if we could just get the worship service right, if we could just get the song service right, then God would come and he would manifest himself in a meeting. And there is a sense in which this is true, because truly God does inhabit the praises of his people. But that is not a primary thing, particularly in the New Testament. The emphasis is on obeying the word of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible said that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey the Lord. Now, if you look at the lives of the scribes and the Pharisees, you look at all of the leaders in the church going all the way back, they all had their idea of what God's will was and what it took to be pleasing to the Lord. As a matter of fact, they would put fences around the word of God and fences around the laws, thinking in some kind of way, okay, that they were pleasing the Lord and that, and that God would be pleased with their behavior. But in Acts chapter 7, the Bible said that they did always, watch this, resist the Holy Spirit. That was God's estimate of their behavior. If you want to turn over, I just want to look at this really quickly. Acts chapter 7, verse 48. You'll remember the story. It is Stephen preaching. 
Stephen is giving one of the great sermons that have ever been preached. One of certainly one of the most revealing sermons and, and gives us insight into much truth. He's talking about how over time God had manifested himself to Israel. He talked about how they had a wilderness tabernacle and then later they had built a magnificent temple. And he is speaking along this line. But beginning at about verse 48, I want to just read. He said, moreover, or however rather, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet said. Now you'll remember just a few minutes ago, we were singing a song. Jesus, make me a sanctuary, pure and holy, you see. See, we want to be a sanctuary. We want to be a place where God can dwell. Why? Because God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Verse 49, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, says the Lord? And what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all of these things? Now this is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 66, verse one and two. You see, all the way back in the Old Testament, all the way back uh, when the prophets were speaking, they were trying to help people understand what God's intention was. He never wanted to dwell in the wilderness tabernacle. That was just a temporary thing until he could move on and what his ultimate goal was. Then he was in the temple for a while, manifesting himself there. But again, that wasn't his ultimate goal. That was just a temporary thing. It's like step by step, God is moving closer to what his ultimate goal is. And that was to take up residence in human beings, in people, to purge them as living temples, if you will, with the blood of Jesus Christ, just like they would cleanse the temple and then allow the glory of God to come and manifest. But notice what God's estimate was of their behavior. Rather than being submissive to God, even though they were mastering the word of God, they were, they were putting fences around it. Notice this. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. You see that? He's telling them, you all were being really religious. You were teaching the word of God. You can quote it backwards and forwards. You can do all these different things. But nevertheless, you are resisting the dealings of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, it had made them to where God could not dwell in them. He said, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of your fathers, uh, prophets rather, did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. So what did they do? They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear a prophetic word. They wanted to take the written word, put a bunch of rules around it, and call it good. But this was not at all God's design. You see, people are trying to create a man-made religion. Even using the word of God, they will do it. So that pretty soon, the things of God are no longer the things of God. They are the things of men. And that's important to understand. I heard a quote one time, and I may have used this even recently, but if not, it bears repeating. Religion is worship in the absence of God. That's what it is. It is worship in the absence of God. People are worshiping. They're going through the motions, but the Lord is not here. I talked about it this morning. The Laodicean church, the Lord was knocking to get into the church. They were still having services. They were still going through the motions, but the Lord was not there. And I'm afraid today that we have figured out ways, and it's nothing new, it's not something that we've just done in the last 10 years or 20, but this has been going on for a long time. And one of the things that I've observed over the years, and, and I, I don't want to be misunderstood, I want to be very careful with what I'm saying. Let me start out by just saying this. 
when God's presence is near, our reaction to it can be emotional. How many of you would agree with that? It can be an emotional thing. Maybe some people cry. Maybe some people get excited. I've been in services where people got excited, took off running and doing laps around the church. I've seen all kinds of Pentecostal manifestations. I've seen people dance in the spirit back and forth and so on and so forth. And all of these are really just responses to the manifest presence of the Lord. I was talking to a brother just the other day that I've only had a few conversations with him in the last maybe 20 or 30 years. And he said something that really got me thinking. He said, you know, in the old days, we would sing everything in the key of G and just sing it as fast as we could. And I thought, well, that explains a lot. What happens when you think, get things really going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster and faster? Well, folks kind of get worked up. The next thing you know, they get excited. I heard a story one time, and I hope you, I hope you don't get upset with this, with this truth that came out. I heard this as a child, but I'm going to relate to you. I remember that uh, a lady was saying in the home church that uh, they used to have the windows open in the meeting. And they had them up, and it was in the summer because it was kind of hot. And they had a service, and it was really rolling. How many of you know what I mean? A Pentecostal church. All of a sudden, a bumblebee came in the window. And one of the dear ladies that got up in her face, she got to screaming and throwing her arms around. And how many of you know, four or five people in the service took off? Well, there is an emotional aspect to the manifestation of the presence of the Lord. And it is vitally important that we make a distinction between what is the presence of God and what is emotion. Because if you get those messed up, you're going to be mixed up. You see, when I was a, a young man, again, I wasn't raised in church. I used to listen to music a lot, secular music. And music has a way of moving you. It can move you to tears. They don't listen. They don't call it soul for nothing, right? Huh? It can get you moving. It can get you feeling a certain way. I've, I've had music cause goosebumps to come up on my arms, and they were not Christian songs. Ballads, as they call them, and just very emotional type songs. So when I truly received the Holy Spirit, when I truly came to the Lord, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in the home church. At that point in my life, I could make a clear distinction between what is emotion that is caused from the music and what is the presence of the Lord. But there are a lot of people today, saints, that cannot make that distinction. And when the music sounds just right, and it's moving them just a certain way, they believe that is the presence of the Lord. Are you still with me? Some of you are looking at me. They believe that emotional feeling that they are getting is the presence of the Lord. If you wanted to manipulate people in a service, you just slide the volume a little louder. I'm going to keep it real tonight because that's all I know how to do. They would slide the volume just a little bit louder and the folks would get animated. And then when the service seemed to be getting a little bit out of control, you could slide the volume back and things would kind of settle down. How many of you know that's an emotional response to what's going on? I remember as, as a young Christian having lots of questions. I would ask questions like this. I would say, brother, and I would ask, I would yeah, ask senior people I thought were senior Christian people. I'd say, brother, explain something to me. How could it be that a person could dance in the spirit and then go outside and act out in the parking lot? I said I was going to keep it real. How could a person dance in the spirit and then go out and get mad because somebody wasn't moving fast enough in the parking lot? How could that happen? Because I was confused. And I thought, well, I said, he told me, he said, the only thing I could tell you, Brother Robert, is in that moment they were just yielded to the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what I believe. I think that oftentimes we are confusing the true moving of the Holy Spirit with the emotionalism that can follow with it. 
I hope you all still like me after tonight. I've often wondered, how is it that people can be in a service and people can say, oh, God is just moving so powerfully tonight and then go right out the door and misbehave and not act like Jesus. I think it is two primary issues. Number one, they don't understand what the true presence of the Lord is. And then secondly, they don't understand what true spirituality is. You see, when I first came to the Lord, the thing that was in vogue was to take your coat off and wave it at somebody and they fall over. I've traveled the country following ministers that can blow on folks and they fall over. I'm not saying it's not real. What I'm telling you is that this was the concept of being spiritual. And if you were really spiritual, you could do these manifestations. But I want you to know tonight that it has taken me 30 years to understand that being spiritual is being Christ-like. I'm going to say it again. Being spiritual is being Christ-like, being like Jesus. This is what it is to be spiritual. Sometimes we, we want to walk around, and I remember we'd go in prayer meetings, and we'd think, we'd have these crazy thoughts in our mind. You know, when we come in to the service, people are going to feel the presence of the Lord when we walk in the door. I'm just being honest with you. They're going to feel the presence of God when we come in the door. But you see, I didn't understand what spirituality really was. It meant that I was making myself a place where the Holy Spirit was welcome and it would manifest in my life in the fruit of the Spirit. Not so much that I could lay hands on somebody and they fall down. Are you still with me tonight? Being spiritual is being Christ-like. And when God is truly moving by His Spirit, if you have sin in your life, God is going to deal with it. You're going to come into the meeting, and God is going to deal with it. He's going to touch you in your heart. He's going to convict you of your sin. The Scripture said that when the Holy Spirit has come, He will convict the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment to come. But I'm sad to tell you tonight, saints, there is a systemic issue that exists in a lot of circles today that people come into a meeting and because they've created an atmosphere and an environment, they have the music just right. They have everything sounding just perfect. They have the heaven button pushed on the keyboard. So it's creating this sort of feeling amongst the people. And it gives them a false sense of the presence of God. Because they could be living in flagrant sin, come into a meeting, feel something, and believe God is approving of their life. Because they are associating that feeling with God's approval. Did that make sense to you? They're feeling something. They believe it's the Holy Spirit. They believe it is God. And they are acting on that. But how many of you know, if you are living in sin, and the presence of the Lord is truly here, you're going to find your way to a good old-fashioned altar. How many of you have ever been in a service, and God started moving, and people just randomly just start coming to the front, bowing their knees, Praying and crying out to God. You see, that's how you know God's presence is truly present. But what can happen is people start getting the idea that if when I'm worshiping and I'm listening to the music and I got the ear pods in or I've got the music going in the car and these feelings that I'm feeling, which may or may not be the result of the Holy Spirit, they begin to trust in them. And they put confidence in them so that they see it as a sign as God, of God's approval. And that is a very, very dangerous thing. So you say, Brother Robert, give me an example. Well, I'll give you an example. If you're living in sin 
and you're living a life contrary to God's word, but you still believe God's presence is upon you, that is a problem. That is a bad problem because there is no way at that point to bring correction. And when I bring this type of thing up to people, people typically get offended. They get upset, they get real defensive, but it is a very serious thing. It is far more serious than what people really know. You see, there's an attitude that goes back all the way to 1 Samuel, and I just wanna turn over there. This is my last scripture for tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 15, I want to show you how this plays out in real life. You will know the story. God gave Samuel express commandments to go out and to destroy the enemy and not to bring back anything, if you will, of the spoils of it um, and to do exactly what he was commanded to do. And what ended up happening? Notice this. I'm going to start at verse number 19 in 1 Samuel chapter 15. Let me go back to verse 15. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now notice, he's talking to Samuel, who is confronting him about what he's done. God's given him a direct order. He has told him to do something, and God expects him to be obedient because he's the king. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. I'm reading from the New King James. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission. And he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop on, down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on a mission on which the Lord had sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the plunder Sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice, you see that, to sacrifice to the Lord, your God, in Gilgal. And here, the next several verses should be axiomatic in our thinking about what God expects of all people. So Samuel said, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. So you see what happened there. Here is Samuel explaining to Saul that the key thing is to be obedient to what the Lord has said. That is what God wants. He does not want a sacrifice in place of obedience. If I come into a meeting and I haven't been living right, because you know what? You bring a week's worth of living into a meeting. If I haven't been living right, if I haven't been serving the Lord, if I haven't been living in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, I cannot come into the meeting and praise and worship my way into a good standing with God. I cannot do it. I cannot come in and begin to sing and think, you know what, that everything's going to be good. As long as I just keep worshiping God, as long as I keep praising Him, as long as I keep bringing my sacrifice of praise, then God will overlook my disobedience. And that is clearly not true. What does God expect? Does the Lord have a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? Behold, to obey is better than a sacrifice. 
That is something that we should learn and we should keep that front and center in our mind. The Lord wants us to obey him. And if we are obedient, we will do well. If we are obedient, Jesus said again in John chapter 14, I will come, my father will come, and we will make our home with you. So what does that mean? If we resist God's word, if we reject God's word, if we resist the dealings of the Holy Spirit, we are not going to know the true presence of the Lord. And it is at that point in your life that the devil will offer you a substitute. And that substitute for the true presence of God is oftentimes the emotion that people feel when they listen to music. And they believe that it is God affirming them in their life. Do you believe in worship, Brother Robert? Absolutely. I was on the worship team for decades. I have led services for decades. I have worshiped, I have done these things for many years. But none of it ever takes the place of good old fashioned obedience to the Lord. You can't cover up a life of disobedience with a whole bunch of singing. But there is a generation that believes they can do it. You say, well, what ends up happening, Brother Robert? I'll tell you what ends up happening. People get stunted in their growth. They never feel a sense of correction. They're doing things and they never feel corrected because they're associating the emotion they feel with the presence of God, which may or may not be the Lord. But God will convict us of our sins. It is so easy, saints, to misinterpret. It is so easy to mistake the presence of God for emotional feelings. It is so easy. You say, what do they do today? I'll tell you what they do today. And this is why I'm so grateful. I'm not grateful that I didn't, wasn't raised in church, but I'm grateful that I was in environments, okay? Concert type environments, listening to music so that I can understand how music can move a person. So that when I truly gave my life to the Lord, I knew the difference. I'm not fooled by it. If I walk into a building and the lights are all out and there's a globe going up here and it's putting lights all over the walls and the music's going a certain way and everybody's just thinking, wow, this is such of the presence of the Lord. But yet people come in with sin in their life and they're not convicted. How can that be? How can that be possible? I submit you to you, it is not possible. The first thing that God's going to do in any of our lives is not to constantly give us a sense of affirmation. He's going to deal with us about the sin that is in our life because we can't go forward without it. Jesus made it clear. He couldn't have made it any clearer. If you love me, keep my commandments, keep my word. And if you will do that, me and my father will come and we will make our home with you. The implication of that is very simple. If you do not obey the word of God, if you reject the word of the Lord, then the presence of God will not be upon your life the way that God wants it to be. And that is the solution. Saul believed the solution was a sacrifice. Oh, we just saved all these animals because we want to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Sounded really spiritual, didn't it? Sounded real spiritual. But the truth was, he violated a direct commandment, a direct order from God. And what a thing to consider. It is my hope and prayer, saints, that in the days and the weeks and the years to come, that God will truly move, not just here at Hillcrest, which we sense God moving. God has healed people. God has moved powerfully. But I want, even when I come into a meeting, when we are having a service, if there is something not right in my life, I want God to deal with me about it. I want him to put his hand on it. 
Not because he dislikes me, not because he's rejecting me, but because it is an obstacle to having God's presence in my life the way that he wants it to be. You see, that is the key thing. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deceived by a bunch of music. I don't want to be deceived into thinking that everything is right between me and God because I don't feel conviction. I don't want that. I want God to give me a double portion of Holy Ghost conviction if he needs to, because the time is short. It was a very shocking thing, saints, and you probably saw the look on my face if you were looking at me when my wife said, our neighbor Curtis has died. You know, I just talked to him, and he was as healthy as I am. And it is just blowing me away. But it tells me we do not know what tomorrow brings. What is your life? It is even a vapor. So it is important when God is dealing with us. When I stand before God, saints, I want to stand before God with clean hands and a pure heart. I don't want anything in my life. I want God to deal with me about it now so that when, I'm, when I face him, I'm ready to go. It doesn't mean that I have to constantly live in fear, but I want to be sensitive to the dealings of the Lord, and I don't want to be deceived by anything. Father, we're just so grateful tonight. Lord, I'm grateful for a church that believes in the Bible. I'm grateful for saints that know how to worship the Lord.